Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It is wonderful to see all of you here. My name is Claire Fraser. I'm the president-elect of AAAS, and I'm also the director of the Institute for Genome Sciences at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. As you know, our former CEO, Rush Holt, announced his retirement last summer. I had the distinct privilege of chairing the search committee to find Rush's successor. What was so inspiring to me over the course of the search was the extraordinarily high caliber of candidates that this position attracted. It reaffirmed to me what all of us already know. AAAS is an incredibly important organization with an inspiring mission, a first-rate staff, and nearly unlimited potential. We sought a candidate who espoused the mission and vision of AAAS and possessed the attributes needed to, in his own words, not just serve as a steward of this institution, but as a leader. We found that person in the man I have the pleasure to introduce tonight, Dr. Sudip Parikh. Sudip is now just one month on the job, but if you've had the opportunity to interact with him, you've no doubt seen what we on the search committee and the board were immediately drawn to. He is strategic, forward-thinking, impact-driven, and really just a nice guy. He's also very humble, and I've introduced him at an event at AAAS, and I know the introduction that is about to follow leaves him more than just a little bit uncomfortable, but he just has to bear with me. For more than two decades, Sudip has been at the nexus of science, policy, and business. The son of Indian immigrants who worked in the textile and furniture manufacturing plants of North Carolina, Sudip entered the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as a journalism major before switching into material science. As an NSF graduate research fellow, he completed his PhD in macromolecular structure and chemistry at the Scripps Research Institute. There, he used structural biology and biochemistry techniques to probe the mechanisms of DNA repair enzymes. Following a presidential management fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, Sudip joined the staff of the U.S. Senate Appropriations Committee, where for nearly a decade he served as science advisor and professional staff. He was responsible for negotiating budgets for the NIH, the CDC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, and other scientific and health agencies. As a key legislative liaison to the R&D ecosystem, Sudip was on the front lines of many science policy issues debated during that time, including embryonic stem cell research, cloning, disease surveillance, bioterrorism, cybersecurity, and the doubling of the NIH budget. After leaving Capitol Hill, Sudip worked for Battelle, the multi-billion dollar research and development organization where he held positions as head of the global agri-food business unit and as vice president and general manager of health and consumer solutions. Most recently, Sudip was senior vice president and managing director at DIA Global, a multidisciplinary membership organization bringing together regulators, industry, academia, patients, and other stakeholders interested in healthcare product development. At DIA, Sudip led strategy in the Americas and oversaw programs that catalyzed progress globally towards novel regulatory frameworks for advanced therapies 
not amenable to existing regulations. We were so thrilled on January 6th of this year when Sudip officially began his tenure as the 19th CEO of AAAS and the executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sudip Parikh. Very generous, very, very generous uh, introduction. Um, I've been asked several times over the past couple of days, why'd you take this job? Why would you want to be CEO of AAAS? Why would you want to lead an organization that's 170 years old? It might be sclerotic, it might be slow, it might be uh, stuck in a business model of the past. Why would you want to take this job? There are a million reasons why, let me tell you, okay? This organization is strong financially. It has uh, incredible reach into the science policy world. We are entering a time, this is an extraordinary time that we're entering. We are entering a time where, when I look at the pages of Science Magazine, and I choose that for no particular reason, when I look at the pages of Science Magazine, I see extraordinary advances, right? Uh, but every time that I see something like uh, the, the movement toward a cure for a previously incurable disease, I also see the sliding backward uh, nature of our world in that more Americans now believe that vaccines are toxic than did 10 years ago. Every time I see exquisite mountains on Pluto or I see a black hole, I also know that there's a small but growing percentage of this population in the United States that believes that the Earth is flat. We, we have a responsibility, and when I say we, I mean the bigger we. The bigger we of folks who are in science, who care about science, we have this obligation, this responsibility to bring science to every table that we sit at. And I don't just mean at the lab bench. I mean we have an obligation to bring science to the legislative table. We have a responsibility to bring science to the business table, the conference room in the business room, uh, and we have a responsibility to bring it to the kitchen table because this is where the decisions are being made that are gonna affect the world. And we are doing science not because, not only because we're interested in the awe that comes from learning something new, and that is fabulous, and I love it too, but we're also doing it because we have children, we have nephews and nieces, we have a, a world, and we're envisioning tomorrow's earth. Well, I envision tomorrow's earth to be a place where my kids and your kids uh, are going to have a chance to rise to their own challenges because we rose to ours. So that's why I took this job. I hope that we're going to be able to work together uh, to do great things. Uh, if, I look at, if I look at what's possible, I only have to look as far as the award winners that I'm going to talk about tonight because they are, they are examples. They are the prototypes of what we can accomplish uh, as members of AAAS and members of the broader scientific community. So I'm willing to commit myself uh, to making sure that we're bringing science to every decision-making table. And I hope that I have the commitment from you as well. Um, so with that, <laughs> with that, I'm gonna turn to those prototypical uh, members of the scientific uh, community uh, that we are gonna honor tonight. Uh, the first, is the AAAS Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science. This annual award was established in 2010 to recognize early career scientists and engineers who demonstrate excellence in their contribution to public engagement with science activities. For the purposes of this award, public engagement activities are defined as the individual's active participation in efforts to engage with the public on science and technology related issues and promote meaningful dialogue between science and society. So that's bringing science to the decision-making tables where they are. So let's learn more about this awardee's engaging work tonight. The AAAS Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science recognizes early career scientists who demonstrate excellence in their public engagement with science activities. 
This year, we honor John Drazen, postdoctoral fellow at the Human Motion Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Drazen has created innovative ways to integrate his public engagement work with his research while also inspiring underrepresented youth. The former college basketball player uses sports to link science and engineering to activities and topics youth already enjoy and understand. By making science relevant, fun, and social, his programs help young people appreciate the full impact that science and engineering can have on their lives. In particular, he aims to reach youth who don't already have an interest in science. As a graduate student in biomedical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, together with his former college teammate John Scott, he created the Fourth Family STEM program in conjunction with the nonprofit Fourth Family Incorporated. This STEM focused summer program, which reaches over 5,000 inner city youth, engages students in hands on activities involving sports science, and engineering. He has also expanded this effort to create the Court Science Academy, a four-day STEM education initiative during the NBA's Summer League in Las Vegas. Middle school athletes recruited from the Junior NBA program use human physiology, data analytics, and engineering to study elite athletic performance through hands-on activities and engagement with a wide variety of scientists and athletes. They also empower student athletes to serve as science role models for youth in their own community. He also uses data from these programs to improve his own research, demonstrating the bi-directional and responsive ideals of public engagement. In addition, Drazen has developed a series of low-cost portable tools he uses for data collection at outreach events, and he monitors the results of his efforts and shares findings through presentations and papers. In this way, his public engagement benefits a broad spectrum of scientists and science communicators. Drazen is expanding his sports science educational model to the collegiate level at the nation's oldest historically black college or university, Lincoln University, as the Penport Arakta Fellow. Drazen is honored for creating long-lasting, scalable approaches to engaging underserved populations about biology, engineering, and statistics, and for working collaboratively to increase diversity in biomechanics research. John Drazen, recipient of the 2020 Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science. It's my privilege to present the 2020 AAAS Early Career Award for Public Engagement to Dr. John Drazen. I love people who can do many things well. Play sports, be able to speak to youth, do science. Uh, that's, it's, it's an amazing ability and, uh, and one that, you know, my favorite, uh, my, favorite, my favorite founding father is Ben Franklin, because Ben Franklin was involved in, uh, he was involved in science, he was involved in politics. Uh, we need people like that. Dr. John Drazen, thank you for coming. Uh, let the triple it now, let's go to the next uh, award the AAAS Manny L. Baumick Award for Public Engagement with Science. This annual award was established in 1987 and recognizes scientists and engineers who make outstanding contributions to the popularization and public understanding of science. In 2018, the award was endowed through a generous contribution by Dr. Manny Baumick, a physicist whose pioneering work on excimer laser technology led directly to many practical applications that are in wide use today, including laser eye surgery, Dr. Bomek is in the audience tonight, so please join me in recognizing him for his commitment to our work and to more effectively communicating science to the public. Right there. Thank you, Dr. Bomek. Thank you, Dr. Bomek. All right. Um, now, let's, let's learn more about this year's recipient. The AAAS Maniel Baumick Award for Public Engagement with Science recognizes working scientists and engineers who make outstanding contributions to public engagement with science. This year, we honor J. Marshall Shepard, Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. Few people put as much time and effort into communicating with a broad set of audiences as Shepard. This eloquent meteorologist combines a strong scientific mind with an uncanny ability to connect with audiences of all types and backgrounds, even on the most polarizing issues. Shepard hosted the weekly show Weather Geeks on the Weather Channel, which aired for almost five years and recently has been turned into a weekly podcast. 
On the show, he interviewed experts in meteorology and related fields about issues of interest to the meteorological community that are often ignored by the mainstream media. Shepard was able to recruit impressive and lively guests, like a conservative former congressman turned climate change warrior. Due to his good reputation in the environmental community, and past service as president of the American Meteorological Society. AMS is the nation's largest and oldest professional society in the atmospheric and related sciences. In addition, Shepard writes blogs for Forbes. His topics range from fundamental climate and weather science to societal impacts of science and occasionally broader underlying topics. His TED Talk in 2018 on what shapes our perceptions and misperceptions about science has been viewed more than two million times. He's also been a sought-after speaker on media outlets including CNN, The Weather Channel, CBS's Face the Nation, and more. In addition to such high-profile engagement, he also speaks at community events, including Rotary Club meetings, and serves on an advisory committee for local science fairs. From 2012 to 2015, he served as an advisor on the AAAS What We Know project, and in 2019 was named winner of the American Geophysical Union's prestigious Climate Communications Prize. He also boasts a large social media presence, including more than 45,000 Twitter followers. Shepard is an outstanding scientist, a gifted communicator, and a role model who has made significant achievements in engaging with the public about weather, climate, and more broadly, Earth and space science. Shepard also practices what he preaches on climate and is committed to reducing carbon emissions in his own life. Thus, he does not fly, and he is accepting this award remotely. J. Marshall Shepard, recipient of the 2020 AAAS Maniel Baumick Award for Public Engagement with Science. It is my great pleasure to present the 2020 Manny Baumick Award for Public Engagement to Dr. J. Marshall Shepard, the UGA Athletic Association Distinguished Professor in the Department of Geography and Director of the Program in Atmospheric Sciences at UGA. As you heard in the video, Dr. Shepard uh, is committed to reducing his carbon footprint. He uh, was unable to travel to Seattle to accept this award. Uh, so uh, accepting on his behalf is Dr. Jack Kay. We'll send him that picture. All right. All right. With that, I want to congratulate our award winners, uh, and we'll uh, be sure to come back tomorrow and Sunday for more award presentations. I mean it. These are, these are prototypes, the prototypes of what it's going to take to change the future. All right. Tonight's plenary session is presented by our longtime partners and friends at the European Commission. Leading the European delegation at this meeting and representing Maria Gabriel, the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education, and Youth, is Director General for Research and Innovation, Jean-Éric Paquet. I'd like to welcome Director General Paquet to the stage. <laughs> Director General Paquet uh, is the Director General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, a position he's held since April of 2018. The Commission's Research and, Develop and Innovation Department is responsible for European Union policy on research, science, and innovation with the goal of helping to create growth and jobs and to tackle grand challenges. He's an expert in international and public policies, and I can, I can speak to that with experience. We just had a very nice conversation where we disagreed vehemently. <laughs> DG Paquet has served in a variety of roles at the Commission for over 24 years. So please join me in expressing our thanks to the EC's long-standing and generous support of this meeting and partnership and collaboration, and welping, welcoming uh, DG Paquet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Good uh, evening, everyone. It's a, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to say a few words uh, at the opening of this uh, plenary session here at AAAS to tell you about tipping points. We are working with many of you on, uh, on climate uh, and science tipping points. We just have an awardee which is working uh, on it on a daily basis. We're increasingly exploring how we can find tipping points in society. And what I want to tell you about tonight is about a political tipping point which occurred in 2019 in Europe, where Europe, which is, I think, today already leading global efforts on climate change, which is driving with many others the Sustainable Development Goal agenda, has seen a very clear and strong tipping points in upgrading its ambitions in 2019. 2019 was a year uh, across the globe, but also particularly in Europe, 
where science has driven the conversation, where around what I call the Greta miracle, our kids and students told us about the value of listening to science, and where extreme weather events last summer also drove that discussion. Out of that in Europe today, we now have a very different political setup in the European Parliament, but also across many of our nations, where the mainstream political agenda, supported and uh, enhanced and propelled by green parties across many member states, is now about how can we, in Europe, deal much more impactfully with what our leaders have labeled an existential threat, the urgent need to deal with climate change. The new European Commission, which started uh, at the, on the 1st of December of 2019, operates against this political tipping point. And our president, Frau von der Leyen, at the very first meeting of uh, this new European government cycle, proposed a European Green Deal. That European Green Deal is not as such a climate or environmental strategy, contrary to the color of the deal. It is about proposing a policy framework, a deeply different policy framework, to change the way our economy, our growth strategies, deliver fair and inclusive outcomes in society, whilst at the same time allowing us to deal with the urgency of climate change, biodiversity loss, and the increasing toll of pollution on the health of our societies. This Green Deal is going to be delivered over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And Europe has, made, uh, has already committed to becoming climate neutral by 2050. We will have European legislation in place in the coming months, which will bind us to that objective, climate neutral by 2050. And we will also upgrade very significantly our obligations under the Paris Agreement, and we will move from a 40% reduction in CO2, which is in today's EU legislation by 2030, to 50, maybe 55% by 2030. This is an extraordinarily ambitious agenda, which is uh, full of uh, challenges, both in terms of investment, but for me, the challenge is much more about developing public policies, cutting across sectors, identifying trade-offs, dealing with those early on, so that these transformations, social, economic, and climate and environmental, can be driven impactfully fast into our societies. That is what that European Green Deal is. Green Deal is. It's a complete game changer politically in Europe. Obviously, we are a very small continent. Our footprint is um, increasingly decreasing, including because we are abating, of course, but also because the world economy and our population is growing across the globe. And so this Green Deal will, of course, need to become a global uh, Green Deal. And there will be uh, a lot of diplomacy uh, out of Europe to bring partners on board in Africa, in Asia, and I hope also with many of you here in the United States. We hope that with this Green Deal, which is essentially an economical effort, changing the way we look at our economy, having these growth policies which drive these deep transformations, that we can then also have our European industry become a benchmark, a standard, hopefully allowing many industries around the globe to follow suit. Now, I'm telling you that because obviously such a challenge of deep transformation will only happen with research and innovation. If you look at uh, making Europe climate neutral, seen from today, probably we can imagine a reduction of 60, maybe 70% with existing technologies as they would be rolled out and with our societies ready to change behavior. But there is still a very, very large gap uh, which is well identified and on which the research and innovation agenda needs now to focus. And this is where European science, the science driven again in our nations, in our member states, combined 
and of course, European Union programs, Horizon Europe, which is the next program starting next year in Europe, uh, a big 100 billion price tag for the next seven years. This is where we will focus our efforts. So expect a lot of interest on our side to be engaging with scientists across the world, with you as a scientific community here in the United States, to find the solutions in technology, in experimentation in society, to drive these very profound transformations. In Europe, we will, uh, in addition, do two very specific uh, new, uh, we will work on two very specific initiatives, which I would like to highlight to finish. The first one is having learned from, from you, uh, we will now try to deliver this Green Deal, this transformation agenda. We will try to focus part of our research and innovation effort around climate and research missions. The man on the moon, which I personally prefer to call a woman on Mars, has inspired us a lot. And we will now have in Europe missions in climate adaptation, clean cities, clean oceans, clean soils, and cancer, which will be rolled out over the next five to 10 years, where we hope to combine a research and innovation agenda with public policy regulation, investment, taxation, mobiliz mobilization of societies to change our societies and transform them around these five missions. The mission objective is being discussed as we speak. We have teams discussing with scientists, policymakers, and citizens across Europe, and I hope we will have defined the very concrete objective under these five areas in the course of the year. This obviously, again, is not just a European effort, and I very much hope that around these missions there can also be interaction across the world and with the United States. These mission objectives, of course, need to be driven by society. We will work with citizens, and that's my last point, to ask them to help us design the objective of the mission and ask them to help us design the delivery roadmaps to implement these missions. And that is really where Europe is also going in science. Try not just to engage with citizens, that is a key dimension and a key responsibility, as was very well said including by the OODs just now. So yes, we also want to do that, and we are learning from you every day how you do that impactfully. But what we also think we need to do much more, that what scientists and industry need to do much more, is to engage with citizens to ask, uh, ask them to help us make the scientific choices that will drive the technologies and the rollout of the technologies tomorrow. Why that? Because in these transformations, technology in isolation will not be enough. We need that our societies drive these transformations, own these transformations, and a deep discussion on technological choices, on science choices, where citizens help us come to these decisions, I think can be particularly impactful if we find the way for that process to be visible. And this is where communication and outreach will, of course, be decisive. So this is, in a nutshell, where European and, and European science research and innovation is today. A new cycle is starting, one which is particularly exciting, I think, for us scientists and researchers and research policymakers. Of course, with that comes a great responsibility, enable and drive these transformations. And I very much hope that Europe will be able to do it also with the United States. Thank you very much. Voilà. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director General uh, Paquet. Uh, you know, that, I, lo I appreciate the bold leadership of uh, Director General ba Paquet and of the European Commission. Uh, the goals are laudable, and, uh, and AAAS looks forward to, uh, to not just having you here, but also to reciprocating and, uh, and joining you there. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's plenary speaker, uh, Marin McKenna. Marin McKenna is an independent journalist who specializes in public health, global health, and food policy. She's a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University and the author of the 2017 bestseller, Big Chicken, The Incredible Story of How Antibiotics Created Modern Agriculture and Changed the Way the World Eats. 
which received the 2018 Science and Society Award and was named a Best Book of 2017 by Amazon, Smithsonian, Science News, Wired, Civil Eats, and other publications. Her earlier award-winning award books are Superbug and Beating Back the Devil. She appears in the 2019 German documentary, Resistance Fighters, and the 2014 US documentary, Resistance, and her 2015 TED Talk, What Do We Do When Antibiotics Don't Work Anymore, has been viewed 1.7 million times and counting, and translated into 34 languages. Marin writes for the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, Mother Jones, Newsweek, NPR, Smithsonian, Scientific American, Slate, The Atlantic, and The Guardian, among other publications. She was a 2018 Pointer Fellow in Journalism at Yale University and has received the 2019 John P. McGovern Award for Excellence in Biomedical Communication, the 2014 Leadership Award from the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics, and the 2013 Byron H. Waxman Award for Excellence, oops, for excellence in Public Communication of Life Sciences. Uh, that's an amazing resume. Uh, there's a lot of awards, and you deserve every one of them. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, to the AAAS stage, Marin McKenna. Thank you for that introduction. I am so sincerely honored to be asked to give this plenary. Um, thank you to the AAAS. <clears throat> thank you to the European Commission. I'm especially thrilled to do this because the, the theme of this meeting, envisioning tomorrow's Earth, tackling the daunting challenges of the immediate and far future, is so closely aligned to a topic that has fixated me for quite a while for two books and several hundred articles, uh, which is the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it is hard for me to imagine a challenge more devastating to the future than the loss of the power of antibiotics a grave and unregarded threat that will be not only a problem in tomorrow's Earth, but is already one right now. Just in the US, more than 35,000 people die each year from resistant infections, and another almost 13,000 die from C. difficile infections brought on by antibiotic use. Globally, the toll of antibiotic resistance is 700,000 deaths a year. And it's been predicted that the, that death toll will rise to 10 million by the year 2050. So you probably could tell from my bio that I am not a scientist. I, I am a journalist. Um, through this work, I've become a sort of inadvertent historian of antibiotic resistance. So I am not here to tell you about my science, but rather to tell you a story about science. And as a writer, I am obsessed with stories, which puts me in good company because we are a story-making species. Making stories is how we record our experience, how we share knowledge, how we learn. I like to imagine our far ancestors huddled around their fires, sharing their stories about the strategies that brought down whatever animals fed the family group that day. Stories are so powerful that when you look across cultures, you find the same shapes of stories, the same plots occurring over and over again. The girl who conceals her gender to fight for her family or her country. The children who work together to defeat a monster or a sorcerer. The orphan who rises to nobility, which is the plot of Aladdin and Cinderella and Oliver Twist, and also of Star Wars. In our struggle with antibiotic resistance, I see one of those iconic plots, the tragic hero brought down by a careless flaw, like Oedipus undone by his ignorance of his parentage, like Othello by the insecurity that makes him vulnerable to jealousy, like Macbeth by the ambition that justifies his killing his king. With regard to antibiotics, we, our society, our culture, have been undone by carelessness. 
We failed to give antibiotics the respect they deserved. We assumed they would always be there. We gave no thought to the consequences of using them in the ways we do, and in that way, we put their power in peril. Antibiotic resistance is now so serious a disruptive force that Dame Sally Davies, now the United Kingdom's special envoy for antimicrobial resistance, has called it as serious a threat to society as terrorism. And Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, called resistance the greatest and most urgent global risk. The reason this feels to me like a classic tragedy is that in a tragedy, the protagonist is warned by another character, by the literal Greek chorus, that they are making a mistake. And over the decades, we had so many warnings that the way we behaved with regard to antibiotics would cause us to risk losing them. I hope it is like a classic tragedy in one other way. In all the great dramas, there's a moment when the protagonist is allowed a moment of reflection, a, a moment when they could change their mind, could reverse their mistake, could take a different path. I think we may be at that moment for antibiotic resistance. We are teetering at the edge right now of the antibiotic era as we have known it. The choice before us is whether to abandon the security that antibiotics gave us, a security that is unique in human history or to enter into a second antibiotic era in which we treat these precious compounds with respect. I do not think it is too late for us to make that choice, but let me tell you a story about how we got to where we are right now. It is striking to me that our disrespect of antibiotics has been so comprehensive because in our history, they are such a recent arrival. The first antibiotic era begins either in 1928, when Sir Alexander Fleming first recognizes the action of penicillin on a dish in his laboratory, or in 1941, when that compound is given to a human being for the first time. 92 years or 79 years, either way, an eye blink in history. Yet that is long enough, one lifetime, that we have forgotten what the pre-antibiotic era was like. We've forgotten that pneumonia used to kill three children out of every 10, that infections after childbirth took almost one woman in every 100, that the major killer in the 1918 flu, the worst pandemic in modern history, was bacterial pneumonia that took hold after flu infection damaged victims' lungs. We've forgotten that a scratch or a cut while shaving could put you in the hospital with what was once called blood poisoning and what we now know as bacteremia and septic shock. We've forgotten as well that sexually transmitted diseases were once the single most destructive force in military history, taking more soldiers and sailors away from battles than the battles themselves did. In World War I, the U.S. Army lost seven million workdays to gonorrhea and syphilis. The only reason STDs were not that war's single most important underminer of readiness for battle is that the war occurred at the same time as the 1918 flu. So it makes sense that when penicillin arrived, it was rolled out on the battlefields of World War II in 1943, it was an absolute sensation. Because of that new drug, hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors survived the war who would otherwise not have come home. When it was made available to civilians a year later, people who would have died lingering terrible deaths from infection were cured in days. Sometimes it seemed almost in hours. So at the time, penicillin was not a prescription-only drug. At least in the United States, it was sold over the counter. And it took off like a rocket, pulled by huge public enthusiasm, pushed by new pharma companies who realized what a stunning earner they had on their hands. 
there does not seem to have been any thought to the downside, even though among the earliest patients in trials of penicillin, there had been signs that the wonder drug would lose its effectiveness surprisingly fast. And so we come to the first of those tragic warnings we received, and it came from the person who knew the drug best. In 1945, Alexander Fleming, penicillin's first parent, effectively the godparent of every drug that came after, received the Nobel Prize in Medicine along with his collaborators. At the award ceremony, he predicted what would come next if penicillin was not treated with respect, and this is what he said. There is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself, and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. Fleming was exactly correct. Within two years, penicillin-resistant staff was causing outbreaks in England. In 1953, it appeared in hospitals in Sydney, Australia. By 1955, it landed in the United States, in fact, right here in Seattle, causing a massive outbreak in the birthing ward at Harborview Medical Center, which is about a half a mile from where you are sitting right now. It sickened 1,300 mothers and 4,000 babies in that ward, and 24 of the babies died. By 1957, penicillin-resistant staff had moved across the United States, and the American Medical Association summoned a panicked meeting in Cleveland, exploring how the problem had gotten so out of control. What came from that panic was, first, a new drug, methicillin, the first of the semi-synthetic penicillins. This is the very first ad that its makers, Beecham Laboratories, ran for it in January 1960 in the British Quarterly Journal of Medicine under its experimental name, Selbenin. You can see that it says, effective against all staphylococci. You can't see it in this image, but the ad went on to boast resistance unlikely to develop. They were right on the drug's infect effectiveness. They were wrong about how long that would last. Within a year, methicillin-resistant staff what we now know as MRSA was identified in a hospital outside London. But what also came from penicillin-resistant staff and the deployment of methicillin and the advent of methicillin resistance was the beginning of a bug versus drug game of leapfrog that we embarked on without ever admitting that the game was stacked against us because the bugs had evolution on their side. What we had done with penicillin without thinking deeply about it was to take the weapons that a bacteria had made to deploy against each other, the product of millions of years of adaptation, and to use them as though they were an inexhaustible resource. And that was foolish, twice over, because by bathing the bacterial world in antibiotics, we accelerated the development of resistance, and we used up those naturally derived compounds whose activity against bacteria had seemed so miraculous. Of course, by 1960, when this ad ran, there were other antibiotics on the market, chloramphenicol, streptomycin and erythromycin, the first of the tetracyclines, the first of the cephalosporins. But each of those lost their power in turn. In just a few examples, vancomycin, a last resort antibiotic, dates from 1955, but was so toxic it didn't actually start to be used until 1972. Vancomycin resistance arrives in 1988. Imipenem, the first of the carbapenem class, released in 1985. Resistance to it arrives in 1998. Daptomycin, meant to replace vancomycin, came on the market in 2003. Resistance to it arrived just one year later in 2004. Antibiotic resistance is such a challenge because it is not a single problem. It is a nested set of problems. For instance, the problem is not merely that new forms of resistance emerge because of the ways that bacteria can pick up and exchange genetic material. Resistance factors can stack up in bacteria, like high-value cards accumulating in a hand of poker. A pathogen that acquires resistance to one class of antibiotics can also acquire resistance to others, making that pathogen multidrug resistant even if it's never been exposed to those other categories of drugs, never had a chance.
to adapt to them. And eventually, if chance favors that bacterium, it will become pan-resistant. That happened in 2008 when physicians outside Stockholm found that an older man being treated in a hospital was carrying a bacterium that was resistant to every drug they could apply to it, except for two. That pathogen had already traveled the world. The man had unknowingly picked it up when he was hospitalized in India, and it went on to travel the world further and to pick up yet more resistance DNA. Today, that suite of resistance factors, which is, was dubbed New Delhi metallobetalactamase for its mechanism and its point of origin, or NDM for short, has been found in bacteria in every region of the world. So bacterial travel would not be so daunting if the occurrence of resistance in bacteria was rare. But another one of those nested problems is that resistance spreads rapidly through populations of pathogens, not just vertically from one generation to another, but horizontally as bacteria make those maneuvers of sharing and surrendering DNA. Thus, for instance, the most common bacterium that causes pneumonia is resistant to the first choice antibiotic used against it at least 30%, in some places in the United States, 50% of the time. Think about that. Whether the most appropriate drug works in a patient or not is essentially the flip of a coin. When I look back at the history of antibiotic use, I find it especially resonant that it was the need to cure STDs that drove antibiotic development. One of those was gonorrhea, and year after year after year since the 1940s, gonorrhea has churned through multiple antibiotics used against it. Today, there is only one drug that still works. So we ought not to be surprised by this, because again, we were warned. 20 years ago, the World Health Organization published the first global alert about antibiotic resistance, and the then Director General said, at the dawn of a new millennium, humanity is faced with a crisis. Formerly curable diseases are rapidly becoming difficult to treat, while old killers are now arrayed in the increasingly impenetrable armor of antibiotic resistance. Yet, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in the States estimates that 30% of the antibiotics pre prescribed in the US each year are not needed at all. And among the rest, significant proportions are prescribed for too long, dose too high, badly matched to the pathogen they're supposed to cure. In all of those cases, increasing the risk that bacteria will develop resistance before or if they are killed. So it's easy to blame healthcare for the loss of antibiotics because that is the setting in which antibiotic use is most visible. But it's not the only arena in which antibiotics are misused. Agriculture bears at least as much of the blame, possibly more of the blame because animal production consumes globally what may be three times the antibiotics that medicine does. And unlike in medicine, almost none of that goes to cure sick beings, which means that while that use risks the defensive adaptation of bacteria to antibiotics attack, it is not balancing that risk against the benefit of achieving a cure. And it was somewhat shocking to me when I began to research this to discover that this practice dates back to the beginning of the antibiotic era. We have been living with the overuse and misuse of antibiotics in agriculture for as long as we have in medicine. And the effects have been equally dramatic. So here is how it starts. Those millions of soldiers and sailors deployed across the world for World War II needed to be fed. Rationing on the home front saved some protein to send out to the troops. But there was also pressure from governments on animal agriculture to vastly increase its capacity. And that was a reasonable risk for agriculture to take because military procurement was a guaranteed market until the war ended. And that guaranteed market went away. 
So while the meat industry struggled to pay for the upkeep of its expanded infrastructure, a random set of events was having an outside influence. Because of the devastation of the war, of course, agriculture had been harmed. Arable land had been destroyed by battles. Fishing fleets had been co-opted by navies that had lost their vessels. But at the same time, there were catastrophic crop failures in Europe, in Asia, in North Africa. In the United States, there was an interruption in cattle production and transport, so severe that it came to be called a meat famine. And it was actually an issue in the first election after the end of the war in 1946. This overwhelming sense that the food supply was fragile pushed food producers to cut costs, to give themselves a margin. They turned to giving livestock cheaper feed. This is actually the start of the coin, corn and soy economy that we have in livestock production today. But cereals didn't supply adequate nutrition, and so they had to go looking for supplements to supplement this new feed that had to be inexpensive as well. Which is where this scientist enters the story. His name was Thomas Jukes of Letterly Laboratories outside New York City, the company that had just filed a patent for the first tetracycline drug, oreomycin, chlortetracycline. Jukes set up a very simple experiment. He went and bought a bunch of just hatched baby chicks, and he divided them up into groups and set one group aside as a control. Then to each of the other groups, he gave standard chicken feed with one of the supplements that was available on the market at the time. Synthesized vitamins, cod liver oil, brewer's yeast. And to one group, he gave the dried, ground up leftovers of the manufacturing waste from making his company's drug. When he weighed the chicks at the end of his experiment, it happened to be Christmas Day, and he did it himself because he'd given his lab tech the day off. He discovered that the birds who received the antibiotic leftovers had gained more weight than any other birds in the experiment, twice as much weight as the birds that got the standard diet. Jukes called this effect growth promotion, and within five years, the amount of antibiotics being given to livestock just in the United States rose to 500,000 pounds a year. The Food and Drug Administration's most recent estimate is that just in the US, animal agriculture now consumes 25 and a half million pounds. Globally, the total is believed to be at least 139 million, predicted to rise to 211 million pounds by the year 2030. So Jukes and the, the scientists who came after him who rushed into this new scientific question were convinced they had solved the problem of feeding the world inexpensively. His tiny dose growth promoters were licensed by the FDA, and they became a routine part of the business of farming from the 1950s. And those licenses were quickly followed by others, allowing slightly larger doses that protected against diseases of crowding in the barns and feedlots of the concentrated animal operations that were beginning to grow up around the world. It's a little shocking to me that Jukes and his cohorts so saw no risk, no downside in these low doses, even though they were performing in animals exactly the low dosing that Fleming had warned would create resistance in human medicine. They ignored warnings from other scientists working in agriculture, like this, said by a scientist at a meeting in the United Kingdom in 1962. A disastrous consequence might be the development of resistance in pathogens against which antibiotics are at present the only means of defense. So those unheeded warnings were prescient. What Fleming had correctly predicted for medicine happened in agriculture as well. The spread of antibiotic-resistant foodborne illness, a thing that had never before existed in the world. The first signs of trouble were in dairy production. Farmers were dosing their cows so heavily with penicillin that children who drink more milk than adults do came down with penicillin allergies, even if they had never taken the drug. Then cheesemakers began to complain that they couldn't make cheese anymore because there was so much penicillin in the milk they got from dairies that it was killing the beneficial bacteria that they used. 
And then people began to fall ill. And children, always the most vulnerable, began to die. In one small town in Yorkshire in England, 15 children died within a few months of infections that were resistant to multiple drugs. The infections were caused by resistant E. coli, a bacterium that, of course, resides in the intestines. And it took a while to ascertain that they originated not in humans, but in animals that had been routinely given antibiotics as they grew. I want to spend a moment on that realization because we owe it to a distinguished scientist who just recently left us, Dr. Stuart Levy, who was faculty at Tufts University in Boston when he died last September and was at that school his entire career, including in 1976 when he set up an experiment to test this hypothesis, so elegant that no one has ever replicated it because no one has ever felt the need. What he did was very simple. He set up an experimental farm in the suburbs outside Boston. He found a property with lots of barns and sheds. He built pens in the largest barn that were locked. He stocked them with baby chicks, the same animals that had proved the worth of Juke's growth promoters. And then he went to the feed store, and he bought two lots of feed, one standard feed containing antibiotics and the other specially compounded with no antibiotics at all. He hired the oldest daughter of the family who lived on this property to be his lab tech. And what she did every day was to feed the birds in a pres prescribed rotation, starting with the antibiotic-free birds and moving to the antibiotic-fed ones. And then once a week, she collected feces from the birds that got bir drugs, the birds that did not, and from her siblings and parents as well. And using those samples, Levy was able to show first that resistant bacteria arose in the guts of the animals receiving the drugs. And then that the same resistant bacteria appeared in the guts of the birds who never received antibiotics. And after a couple of months, they appeared in the feces of the farm family, too. With those results, he established for good that giving antibiotics to healthy animals was a risk twice over by releasing resistant bacteria into the environment via the animal's droppings when they were alive, and by conducting resistant bacteria into slaughterhouses when the animals were killed and turned into meat. There was a brief hope at the time that Levy's discoveries would lead to wholesale reform in the use of antibiotics in agriculture 25 years now after the FDA had approved the licenses for the practice. But the FDA's attempts at reform were foiled by political interference from Congress. Levy's warning was heard, but only in Scandinavia and Western Europe, which banned Jukes' growth promoters in a series of steps across the 1980s, the 1990s, and finally for good at the end of 2005. No such ban existed here in the US for almost 40 years. But events proved Levy right. In 1987, Hundreds of people fell ill in California as a result of ground beef from dairy cows that had been sold for milk, for meat after their milk dried up. Cows that had been prophylactically fed chloramphenicol to get them through a few more cycles of calf bearing and milking. Across the 1990s, thousands of Americans developed salmonella resistant to fluoroquinolones because two manufacturers of those antibiotics had brought out veterinary versions that were identical to human use drugs. That resistance meant that when sick people went to physicians for relief, they could not be treated with the go-to drug the doctors would reach for, which happened to be the most common fluoroquinolone, Cipro. Starting in 2001, researchers in California and a separate set in Minnesota demonstrated that some portion of the millions of urinary tract infections that occur in the United States each year are due to resistant bacteria traveling on poultry meat. We think of UTIs as not a very important problem, possibly because they occur mostly to women. But significant numbers of UTIs every year escalate to kidney infections, to bloodstream infections, and to death from sepsis. Let me show you one outbreak. This is a map drawn up by the CDC. It gives you a sense of what these resistant outbreaks are like. 
This represents the final case count of one outbreak of drug-resistant salmonella that stretched across 2013 and 2014, emanating from a single chicken processing plant in California, where chickens routinely fed antibiotics were being slaughtered. The known case count, which is captured on this map, is 638 cases in 30 states and territories. But the CDC routinely estimates that for every case of foodborne illness that is seen by a doctor or confirmed by a laboratory, there may be 30 to 40 more that are never detected, which means that this single outbreak may have sickened more than 20,000 Americans. And outbreaks like this are not uniquely American. In 2004, the Netherlands endured the rapid spread of a particular form of drug-resistant staph which arose in pigs, routinely given tetracycline, crossed to pig farmers, and then moved outward into society to infect people with no connection to farms. That staph strain came to be known as livestock MRSA. Its technical term is ST398 or CC398. But it caused outbreaks in the Dutch healthcare system so severe that the government required that any pig farmer going into a hospital would have to preemptively be placed in isolation until they could be shown to be clear of the germ. And in 2015, Chinese and British researchers revealed that people and pigs and pork in markets were all carrying bacteria holding an identical resistance signature, one that confers protection against an old antibiotic called colistin. It's one of the very last ditch antibiotics that we have. Colistin is an old drug that medicine abandoned because it was so toxic, and in the years that medicine didn't want it, agriculture eagerly picked it up. And then resistance got so bad that medicine turned to colistin again and discovered that this fast-moving, mobile resistance had been generated against it. At this point, five years later, the gene conferring resistance to colistin, known as MCR, has been found in people, in animals, and in the environment in every region of the world. And again, this should have come as no surprise, because we had been warned that these consequences would likely occur during the time that Europe was regulating antibiotic use in agriculture and the United States and Canada were not. Multiple reports were published warning of the danger of this practice. In just one, published by the Institute of Medicine 20 years ago, the IOM said, mounting evidence suggests a relationship between antimicrobial use in animal husbandry and an increase in bacterial resistance in humans. And it was another warning that we failed to heed. I have often wondered why. When we received so many of these warnings, we so persistently failed to act on them. It's possible that we didn't take seriously the threat of antibiotic resistance because we always assumed that however bad it might get, there would always be another newer drug that would take care of it for us. And if that is what we thought, we were wrong. Look at this timeline of the introduction of the major antibiotic classes. You can see the burst of innovation at the hopeful beginning of the antibiotic era, and then a long curve down to where we are today with almost no truly new, clinically significant antibiotic classes arriving in the past 30 years. And if you were a pharma company, despite what the Supreme Court says about companies being people, I think most of you probably are not. But pretend for a moment that you are. This decline in new compounds would make perfect sense. The problem is not just that novel, druggable compounds became harder to make, though that is true. It's also that the market ceased to reward companies for making these crucially needed drugs. So look at this analysis of what a company spends and earns for a new drug. It was drawn up in 2015 by the British Review on Antimicrobial Resistance, which was chartered by then Prime Minister David Cameron. The numbers that you always hear bandied about in pharma have been that to bring a new drug to market of any type takes 10 to 15 years of research and development and about a billion dollars. And those numbers were not inaccurate. They may even have been conservative. But what they left out was what happens after that hypothetical drug is achieved, after the FDA approves it, 
and the compound enters the market to be evaluated by formularies and prescribed by physicians. Or maybe not prescribed. If it's an especially superb drug, a new compound might be held back, earning nothing until there's nothing else left to use. And during all the time a drug is tested and deployed, bacteria are going to be developing resistance to it. There has never yet been an antibiotic to which the bacterial world could not adapt. So what this timeline shows is that in an open market, a new antibiotic gets to profitability, pays back its R&D spending, rewards its investors, begins to make money only two years before it loses its patent protection and becomes vulnerable to competition. Under those circumstances, it is a completely rational act for companies not to make antibiotics anymore, and in fact, they are not. Over the past decade, almost all of the major pharma companies that once made antibiotics have withdrawn from the business. Novartis, AstraZeneca, Eli Lilly, Sanofi, Allergan, Pfizer, all closed or sold off their antibiotic portfolios, devoting themselves to making compounds that will not lose their power and that represent reliable income streams. That's cancer drugs, cardiovascular drugs, drugs for diseases of lifestyle. Antibiotic development has been left to small biotechs, often new companies, often with only a single drug, and the market is not kind to them. Just before Christmas, the company Melinta Therapeutics, which was co-founded by a Nobel Prize winner, entered Chapter 11. Last spring, the company Achaogen also declared bankruptcy. It auctioned off its remaining assets and shut down in June. Both of those companies had new antibiotics that had been cleared the FDA and had come onto the market, but the market did not reward them with prices that could keep their companies afloat. And they are a cautionary tale now for anyone else who tries. So, warnings again. In January, the WHO published a review of new antibiotic products that are now in development. They found there are 60, 50 antibiotics, 10 biologics at some stage in the pipeline. But they also found that almost all of those products were not actually new in any significant sense. If deployed, they would bring little benefit over existing treatments, and very few of them target the most critically resistant bacteria. The WHO's Director General, Dr. Tedros, said when the report was released in January, never has the threat of antimicrobial resistance been more immediate and the need for solutions more urgent. So here we are, almost 100 years from when penicillin ended the pre-antibiotic era, wondering whether the post-antibiotic era is in sight. That would be a time like the pre-antibiotic era when infections would be deadly, but now would likely be worse than then. Because the achievement of antibiotics allowed people to live who would never have survived in earlier years. There are millions of people in the world today who live with compromised immune systems. And if we lost the power of antibiotics, they would be the first to fall. Cancer patients, AIDS patients, transplant recipients, premature babies. We would put at risk anyone who benefits from our ability to install foreign objects in the body. Stents for stroke, pumps for diabetes, ports for dialysis, joint replacements. An analysis in the British Medical Journal a few years ago estimated that without antibiotics, one-sixth of the athletic baby boomers who destroyed their joints with jogging would die from infection after receiving a new hip. We'd likely lose surgery, no heart operations, no prostate biopsies, no cesarean sections. We'd have to learn to fear, to fear problems that now seem minor to us because antibiotics made them minor. Breaking a limb, getting in a car accident, giving birth. There are already physicians around the globe. Some of them are in this city, and I have spoken to them, who will admit they have had patients who died of infections for which no antibiotic worked. Just last fall, the CDC's director, Dr. Robert Redfield, said this. 
Our nation must stop referring to a coming post-antibiotic era. It's already here. So people ask me, since I am immersed in this history, if I get depressed about it. <laughs> and in fact, I am not discouraged. I said at the start, the story of antibiotics and our disrespect of them reminds me of a classic tragedy because we succumbed to our intrinsic flaw and we failed to listen to warnings of disaster. Even when it ought to have seemed clear to us that our choices were incorrect. But the reason we remember the great tragedies, 2,400 years after Sophocles, 400 years after Shakespeare, is not only because they are heartbreaking. It is because they are redemptive. They show us how it is possible to put a community back together after transgression, to glimpse after a lifetime of mistakes, the right path. The antibiotic era has lasted almost one lifetime, and I think we face a choice now, whether we sacrifice antibiotics to our continued heedlessness, or whether we reframe our relationship to them. I think it is possible we will choose the better path. I see some reasons for hope. Let me tell you about a few of them. In its last days in office, in 2017, the Obama administration finally banned Thomas Jukes growth promoters, a full 40 years after the FDA attempted to act on Stuart Levy's research and was prevented by ag state congressmen. A few months before that, the central government of China unilaterally took the old antibiotic colistin out of the national formulary used by its veterinarians. China was so embarrassed by the worldwide spread of colistin resistance via that gene, MCR, that it felt doing better was worth the sacrifice of depriving farmers of 8,000 tons of what had been a useful drug. Improvement in ag use of antibiotics, as in China, is not limited to government action. In 2014, the chicken firm Purdue Foods, the fourth largest poultry company in the United States, announced that it planned to take all of its chicken production antibiotic-free. In fact, they said at the point they made the announcement, they had done it for 95% of their production already. Five years later, they have hit their goal of going antibiotic-free, and they have dragged the rest of the U.S. poultry industry behind them. Last year, 53% of the meat chickens grown in the United States were grown using no antibiotics at all. Antibiotic reduction succeeds in chicken because chickens are uncomplicated animals. On average, we only allow meat chickens to live 42 days and they spend all that time in one barn. Cattle and hogs are more challenging animals, but antibiotic reduction is happening in those species too. McDonald's, one of the best known restaurant names in the entire world, committed in 2018 to ending the routine use of antibiotics in its entire global supply chain of beef. To turn back to medicine, I, I find this statistic a bit astonishing, but every year, five out of every six Americans receives an antibiotic prescription. We should admit, some portion of those antibiotics are probably not needed for infections. What they are is anti-anxiety drugs. Not for patients, but for doctors. Prescribing antibiotics protects hospital physicians from the unnerving feeling that they may have missed a diagnosis. Prescribing protects outpatient physicians in medical offices and drop-in clinics and urgent care centers from fear of a bad Yelp review because patients asked for antibiotics and the physicians said no. So it's heartening to me that the Urgent Care Association which is the professional organization for urgent care centers, both independent and affiliated with hospitals, sought out a summit meeting with the CDC two years ago, and now has created a certification program for its members to prove they're abiding by the CDC's core elements of antibiotic stewardship. 
and in the antibiotic marketplace, too, there is encouraging news. Four years ago, the US government and the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom clubbed together to create CARB-X, which is an accelerator for very early stage antibiotic research. It's based at Boston University. Since then, CARB-X has amassed $500 million to reimburse companies whose research is too early and too risky for investors to be interested in it. They're now supporting more than 50 projects for new compounds and diagnostics, and the first generation of those projects are moving into phase two and phase three trials. The thing I find especially reassuring is that despite these uncertain prospects, there are people who still want to find and make antibiotics and antimicrobials. And in the past year, here are a few whom I've met. At Rockefeller University in New York City, Dr. Sean Brady found a new antibiotic class by mining common soil, which was the original source of the organisms that made some of the earliest antibiotics. But by the 1970s, researchers were saying that soil was exhausted, yielding the same compounds over and over again. In fact, what they were perceiving, though they didn't know it at the time, was they had, did not have the ability to culture most of the organisms that are found in dirt. Brady and his team got around that limitation by extracting the DNA from soil bacteria and then searching through it for gene clusters that resemble ones already present in known antibiotic-making organisms. At Emory University, Cassandra Quave travels the world to find plants that are featured in old wives' tales of botanical cures and then takes them into the lab to identify the compounds that justify the myth. And her team has already found a compound in an invasive Brazilian plant that interrupts staph quorum sensing, a topical antimicrobial in ginkgo seeds, and a component of tree bark that inhibits biofilm formation. Stephanie Strathdee was an HIV epidemiologist when her husband, Tom Patterson, was felled by a pancreatic abscess caused by a completely resistant strain of Acinetobacter. And in a desperate search to save his life, she embarked on a hunt for bacteriophages, viruses that had not been used in the United States therapeutically since the 1930s. She recruited a worldwide network through Twitter, and they delivered. They found phages for Patterson's infection, and he survived. And at the same time, she revived enthusiasm for this lost cure, which had never passed FDA approval. The FDA couldn't figure out how to trial bacteriophages now. Clinical trials are beginning in several places, and Strathy has co-founded the first center in North America at UC San Diego, studying clinical application of bacteriophage. So we have people and entities willing to conserve antibiotics, to fund the creation of antibiotics, and to discover and develop them again. This is all good news, and yet we should not assume that the future the second antibiotic era, if we choose to enter into it, is assured. We struggle so much still with how to use antibiotics appropriately. This is a map of variation in prescribing across regions in the United States. Look at the difference in those colors. Certainly from region to region, misuse and overuse is occurring. And that is not even to address the vast overuse of antibiotics in the developing world, where inexpensive drugs that are sold casually, often outside regular networks, can fill gaps in healthcare access and can, can compensate for lack of clean water and good sanitation. Just two weeks ago, a team of Swiss researchers uncovered in a study strikingly, shockingly high rates of antibiotic use in children in low and middle income countries. Children who were taken to medical care for respiratory infections got antibiotics in 80% of their visits, far higher than we would consider appropriate. In Uganda, for just one example, children got an average of 59 prescriptions before their fifth birthdays. And as much as we need to control misuse of antibiotics in the world's medical care, we will also face pressure still to control them in agriculture. This is a prediction by the USDA of how demand for animal protein will rise in China up to the year 2025. All over the global south, new middle classes are emerging. 
And one thing they are doing with their newfound income is buying more meat. To raise that meat, companies, countries will inevitably turn to the kind of intensive, high throughput animal raising that antibiotics enabled to begin with. They will misuse antibiotics, as we in the industrialized West did, unless we can agree on a different path. In my view, the most important point is this. If we are to have a second antibiotic era, it will have to be founded on a fresh relationship to antibiotics, one based not on heedless exploitation, but on respect. Like the oceans, like the climate, antibiotics are a shared natural resource, a gift given to us by millions of years of evolution, which we literally cannot live without. And like the oceans, like the climate, we are waking up to the reality of having squandered them. As a culture, I think we have begun to understand the mistakes we made to endanger the oceans and the climate, and we are beginning to act to ameliorate the damage. With antibiotics, we are not there yet. As the editorial board of The Lancet observed in January, we have had plenty of advocacy. What we need now is action. If we can achieve a second antibiotic era, it will only be through acting in a different manner than we have before, through acknowledging our mistakes, through being willing to be humbled as the tragic heroes are humbled, when they glimpse how their lives could have been lived differently. I think a second antibiotic era is possible if we acknowledge that we cannot expect to perturb the microbial world and not pay for it. If we embrace, as the Nobel Prize winner Joshua Lederberg once wrote, that there is nothing in the world from which we are remote. If we trust here in the twilight of the first antibiotic era that it is possible to change for good. Thank you. Thank you, Marin, for that hopeful uh, message at the end and for an excellent talk. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming this evening. This concludes our formal programming for the first full day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Good evening. <laughs>